Hi, everybody. For those who haven't met me before, I'm Jeff Mahoney. I'm director of SUSE Labs Data and Performance. And today I'll be talking about securing the SUSE IT infrastructure using Velociraptor. A quick agenda. We're going to go over uh, some basic things at the beginning, discuss the components and architecture, talk about what the current status is, and then I'll give a brief demo. Um, and I suppose Q&A and thanks aren't on the agenda, but uh, they are at the end. So what is this thing? We need an, the ability to monitor our Linux servers to make sure that we know what's happening should there be an intrusion on the network. And this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we need to have active measures in place. It means to, that we need to be able to discover patterns when it looks like something's going a little bit sideways. Um, we need it because this is the, the future we live in. We have to have certifications for security, and we have to be able to show that we're uh, taking the proper steps. Um, we're actually getting some real focus on security and engineering network now, and this is one of the tools that we have to do it. We're looking at uh, Velociraptor because uh, IT security initially wanted to use CrowdStrike Falcon, um, which is a, a perfectly fine product, but it uh, uses closed source kernel modules in ways that um, let's just say we don't really agree with and was going to pose a challenge for deployment in inside the engineering network because it also does things like uh, updates itself over the network, um, including the kernel modules and all of that, which uh, for common criteria purposes doesn't really fly. So we started pushing back and um, presented the idea of developing an alternative for ourselves. Um, and the baselines requirements for that should be pretty obvious. It needs to be open source, it needs to be maintainable, no closed source kernel modules, and we should try to make it as easy as possible to configure on the endpoint. That means you don't need to change your audit settings, you don't need to change SSH, you don't need to do anything like that. And it meets the requirements provided by IT security, which I'll go over briefly, but I don't wanna dig into too deeply. So the feature requirements that we got were logging, of four major types of things, user events, file monitoring, process monitoring, and networking. Now this is targeted mostly toward, or well, it's targeted towards servers. The agreement that we have with IT security is that if we can get 95% deployment on servers, then client endpoints uh, will be exempt. And the process monitoring and file monitoring uh, are things that I know a lot of us on our client endpoints would object to having. So this is a, a goal that we'd like to attain. There's a web GUI. And these are all things that you'd expect for any modern application. TLS encrypted, multi-factor authentication, timestamps and UTC. Um, rather than also having you know, fine-grained permissions that say XYZ, there's predefined user roles. So you can be an admin or, a, uh, or just someone who can read the results or someone who can write the artifacts. And the ability to list and manage the endpoints and assign labels, uh, including quarantines. Now, we decided to come up with this architecture, which uh, the, da the dashed line is a Docker Compose environment that has a Velociraptor server, which is both the front end and the uh, what front end that the clients connect to directly to report their events, and the admin UI that uses the API. We have a Trafic container that handles uh, a reverse proxy for TLS, because by default, Velociraptor uses its own CA for communication which is perfect for the, the use case of the, the endpoints connecting to it because then it's a, a private ecosystem. But it also would mean that any uh, console users would end up needing to uh, use that CA as well. And we wanted to try to limit how much configuration would be needed in that case. So instead we use, uh, at least in my demo, I use an Acme server on my home network, uh, but realistically we could use any Acme server or provide certificates directly. The, Client endpoints will cache any write back that they have. So if the Velociraptor front end is down, they'll start queuing up events until it comes back up and then they'll push them all at once. Now, one of the uh, key things that IT security wanted is the ability to push all these events to Humio, which is now also owned by CrowdStrike, but it's uh, a system that collects events and then you can run pattern matching against them. And one of the powerful things about it is that uh, you can use the, the patterns that CrowdStrike provides to match common, uh, common attack patterns 
quickly without having to, to do all the work yourself. And so this is really what IT security wanted is this pipeline from events uh, on the endpoints all the way through Humio so that they can uh, take action. Now, the clients do the, the write back uh, caching, but the server doesn't because it's not really designed to do that. So I started looking at ways to do that. And I chose Kafka as a simple, well, it's not really that simple, but it's a message broker. It does stores, store and forward. It will keep the events until uh, they're accepted on the, end, the uh, remote end. And that way we know that we're not losing events even if uh, there's a network disruption uh, between Humio and our environment. Now, what is Velociraptor? It's a digital forensics and incident response tool. It's written in Go. It has a, uh, a, front, a, a user interface that's written in React JavaScript. And internally, it's a powerful system model, modeled on flow and event streams created using VQL, which is a SQL-like uh, language uh, that uses a combination of functions and plugins to collect data from endpoints, to process it, and to present it as rows of data. The server offers the front end for clients to ingest the events and to receive commands and web services for the React admin console and API backend. It's relatively lightweight on the endpoint, um, and I'll show you what a, a config file looks like for that pretty soon. Um, and it does offer the multi-role security model that uh, IT security required. Now, I touched on this already, but uh, I suppose we can skip this slide. And Humio is not open source. There isn't really anything that's comparable out there. And practically speaking, we need the CrowdStrike database in order to analyze the events. So it makes sense to, to use one of their things. Uh, lastly, the, the last component is the Kafka Humio gateway, which is just this application that sits there and listens for Kafka events and forwards them to Humio and then says, hey, we're done once Humio uh, ingests them successfully. Now, one of the things that isn't clear so far is that although the Velociraptor server runs on Linux systems uh, and the client runs on Linux systems, it's clear that the developers uh, upstream are mainly focused on Windows clients. So there's a number of features that we haven't been able to, uh, that we had to implement as part of this. The existing features that we already had were the web GUI that offers interfaces for managing clients, artifacts in the server and client, notebooks and remote access. Artifacts are collections of queries, and they can be either uh, chained together just as a series of queries that you want to gather uh, separate sets of information for, or they can be connected so that you have one query and then you iterate over that to generate new data. Um, and in both instances are used all over the place. It does support multi-factor authentication uh, using external authentication systems via OpenID, via OAuth2, uh, I mean, it can use Google, Azure, um, GitHub, which is what I, I use on mine, uh, as well as OpenID Connect, which is uh, what the demo in uh, the engineering cloud used uh, in May, which uses the uh, OpenSUSE OpenID Connect. It does support user classes as a, a role of a, a set of predefined permissions. Um, a user can have more than one role of, assigned, but you really need to be careful about it. Uh, can, uh, chaining them together uh, because it can come up with different combinations of permissions that might not be what you expected. Um, this is actually one of the things I tried to make obvious when I wrote the user admin tool so that you can select multiple roles and it will tell you exactly what the combination of permissions ends up being. It does have auditability. Uh, you can monitor the artifact stream uh, to both uh, create log entries as well as individual discrete events that we forward to Humio. And that means that changes in the UI, changes uh, that you're applying to clients, changing uh, artifacts, uh, remote command execution, all these things end up generating logging events that are attached to a user. So it's not just, um, you know, IT security having the ability to execute things on the endpoint without uh, anybody noticing. Uh, the client agent is, uses a simple configuration file. It can uh, do syslog parsing for generating log events, and it can inject audit rules and parse the events that come out of it. Now, like I said, there's, it was really targeted towards Windows client, so there was a lot of work that we needed to do. Um, some of the issues that we have are uh, kernel issues, interfaces, and some are uh, 
features that we're missing in Velociraptor. So for example, the kernel doesn't offer any way to associate connection attempts, either ingoing or outgoing, with the PID or even the user, um, because the information is just not there. Uh, we can audit, say, the connect system call, but that ends up getting messy fast. Um, and moreover, the audit logging doesn't provide uh, visibility through pointers, especially for things like ioctals. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge to get around. There's no way to track DNS queries without additional system configuration. So yes, we can have the resolver start logging things, but that depends on the configuration of the system, and that's not something we wanted to do. We need to be able to log scheduled events like cron or systemd timers, and there's no way to generate that automatically right now. There is no support for systemd journal. There was no GUI for user administration, and although there were forwarding uh, artifacts for Splunk and Elastic, there was nothing for Humio or Kafka. There was no support for quarantine Linux hosts, and the incomplete host info for Linux hosts was sort of frustrating because uh, it's pretty complete for Windows, but it would give you like host name and kernel version, and that's about it for Linux. Now, most all, all the all the missing features on this slide are implemented now, and I'll get into the details of some of the inter more interesting ones, and Nick will get into uh, how we solve the problems with network connection attempts, DNS, and all that. Um, but one of the ones that I really want to touch on is audit, because there's two ways to consume audit events. There's the unicast uh, netlink socket and the multicast let netlink socket. And if you want to be audit D, you claim the unicast socket, but that would mean that Velociraptor comes in and kicks out audit D, which is a configuration change, and we didn't want that. But it's really easy to lose events when you're listening on the multicast socket, because although the kernel tries really hard not to drop events for the unicast socket, it doesn't care for the multicast socket. So it's really easy to lose them. And we ran into this in early testing, where even on lightly loaded systems, we'd start getting messages about missing events. And if we're going to have missing events, then it's not a whole lot of practical value, especially as the system gets loaded. The way it was structured is that every user of the audit plugin had their own network, that link collect connection and would have their own rules. And it just was kind of a mess. It would also mean that um, if, say, Audit D got restarted, the audit rules inserted by Velociraptor would be lost. Um, so it was really a, a, a simplistic view of how to consume audit events that needed a lot of attention. So I ended up re-architecting re it pretty much entirely. It had a single receive buffer, and now there's one buffer per packet that's kept in a, in a pool, uh, along with the uh, the space for the parsed event and finally the fully assembled event, so that uh, we're not constantly freeing and reallocating memory. We uh, ex we handled the the signal from uh, receive from that uh, mentions that uh, the socket buffer is not big enough, and we process that and and uh, resize the socket receive buffer. Uh, so that we don't lose events that way. Um, it was using a blocking receive, which uh, has a couple of annoying quirks. It means that you never know uh, if you're when you've consumed all the events. It also means you can't exit uh, the plugin unless you receive event uh, to to handle the system call. So now it uses non-blocking receive and epoll. It also consumes all the events that are pending at once, um, and then uh, just spools them up into a queue. Uh, it specifies the rules in the audit call, which allows us to monitor which rules are in place. And if they disappear for any reason, we can log an event saying the rules were changed and then reinsert them. Rather than having a single uh, instance per plugin call, now there's a producer subscriber model for all of the callers, and only one thread receives the events from the kernel. And it's a pretty straight line. It receives the messages in a loop, and uh, these are both configurable, but on my systems, I found that 2,500 messages accumulating, or 500 milliseconds, seems to be a pretty good balance point to, in to ensure that we don't lose events while pushing them through quickly enough. What I found was that oh, my, my test case was running uh, while in true in a loop. So it would generate tens of thousands of events in a second, and uh, I was able to capture them all. Now I'll pass over to Nick to talk about the cool stuff he did with eBPF. Uh, 
so yeah, my name is Nikolai Borisov. I look nothing like the guy on the slide and I'm actually part of the file systems team. But on this project in particular, I ended up working on some of the missing functionality for, for Velociraptor. So, okay. So let's first see what the requirements were and those were set by the security team essentially. So this is the information that they needed in order to do their job. So first uh, they, they wanted us to be able to uh, essentially snoop or rather sniff all the DNS requests that the machine would do. So presumably the logic there is that if you have, um, if you've been attacked and there is some payload, um, which has been installed on the machine, it will try and connect to some, uh, to some domain, which would serve as the command and, um, uh, command and control server. Okay. So we would also naturally want it to snoop all outgoing or incoming, uh, TCP connections and it's so they, I think they, they actually required also the UDP connections, but since UDP is a connectionless protocol, I did not implement anything for UDP because we did not have clear requirements what precisely was required. So for the time being, we only support uh, snooping all outgoing and incoming TCP connections. Uh, some of the more um, easier things uh, that, I, that I used to initially uh, sort of uh, get my feet wet with BPF and how to actually integrate into the Velociraptor project was to basically uh, sniff for all uh, immutable files being created. So that would mean a file created and the immutable uh, CH utter flag being set. Uh, that, that, was, that was one of the first um, occasions where uh, all its uh, deficiencies were discovered. And also, uh, also one of the requirements was to basically log all the maintenance jobs being created on the machine, in particular cron jobs. So th those are the functional uh, requirements that we knew we had to satisfy. However, there are obviously more, uh, and those come in the form of uh, being implicit ones, because essentially, uh, all the solutions to implement those those explicit requirements they have to be fast right because no one would otherwise run the the security agent if it's uh, not compulsory or if it's mandatory and it uh, essentially grinds your machine to a halt because it's doing things in an inefficient way uh it's, it's not going to be working right it's not going to be satisfying uh, the functional requirements it has so it has to be portable in the sense that we want it to be able to essentially write one version of the tools and then be able to use them in a heterogeneous uh, set of machines. So this means uh, pretty much, um, so when I when I spoke with the security guys, they said we have a SLES uh, 15 SP2 and SP3 kernels. We also have, I believe, uh, SLES 12 SP5 were also one of the targets and they have to be maintainable and portability and maintainability here sort of falls within uh, the same category where it should be possible to reuse as much as existing facilities as possible. Uh, however, unfortunately, like if we could have done it via ODD, that would have been perfect. However, that turned out to not be the case. So maintainable in this case also falls within the portable category where we ideally should have one version of the tools and they should just work across different uh, kernels. So after thinking a bit, okay, how to best achieve that, of course, what is, uh, what is the answer to most questions in the Linux kernel nowadays? eBPF, right? So I'm not gonna go into uh, like a lot of details of what eBPF is, but for our, for our purposes, it's basically a framework which allows us to uh, execute arbitrary code, uh, code anywhere in the kernel. And there's a little uh, start here around anywhere because it's not exactly anywhere, but for our purposes, uh, it suffices. And also, uh, it allows us to do that fast because it really uh, boils down to one extra function call inside the kernel. Well, probably not not exactly one function call, but it's not uh, it's not anything crazy. So just a quick uh, just a quick uh, overview of what eBPF is. It's pretty much a framework where you can where you have a bunch of hard coded um, hook points. Uh, you can you can use, you can essentially hook on any instruction via K probes, but I'm not really looking into that here. Uh, basically, we have eBPF that has well known hooks in the sockets uh, subsystem, in the TCP IP stack itself, uh, in the VFS or on the Cisco's or on uh, trace points. Um, or even you can uh, execute code uh, directly on your network card if you have one of those uh, more fancy uh um, more fancy network adapters for our purposes 
actually I did use, uh, well, I did use uh, a probe on and you'll see that in a bit, I did use K probes, I ended up using K probes and K red probes. Okay, um, so another functionality which is sort of core to BPF, which enabled us to do the maintainable slash portable requirements, that's the so-called uh, BTF or the CORE, C-O-R-E. Um, so, because just pure speed is, is, is not sufficient. You also need a way to, to sort of maintainably achieve what it is that you want to achieve. And thanks to BTF and CORE, we can do that. So BTF stands for BPF type format. And it's essentially a minimalistic, minimalistic a compact format for debugging information that is derived based on, I believe, Sun, uh, Sun compact format, if I'm not mistaken. And the idea is that uh, after the kernel is compiled, then uh, Paho can be run on the resulting dwarf and it can produce the BTF information. And that that is actually slipstream to the resulting kernel image. And it's I think it's something like three megabytes in size to contain all the the debug information in BTF format for the whole kernel. In comparison, the dwarf is something like five or six hundred megabytes. You can find a detailed description here at this URL, and it was um, available by default in SLES 15 SP4, which is one of our target kernels. And for SLES 15 SP3, we actually had to get an ECO in place, but that's uh, that's done. So those two kernels are essentially support that. Uh, capabilities. And the next uh, bit of, inf uh, of technology that I ended up using is uh, CORE. CORE stands for compile once, run everywhere, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve uh, during development of those tools. So essentially what it stands for is it incorporates a bunch of different technologies. So one of them being BTF to have the debug information so, so that it, BPF core knows what the layout of the structures that you, and the functions that you want to hook are. Um, it also involves uh, libbpf, which is a C-based library. It lives within the kernel uh, source code and it's essentially a loader which can deal with BPA, with the so-called BPF relocations. And finally, there's the c -Lang compiler that is able to record relocation information. So when you are accessing, and I have examples um, further on, that basically show you uh, when those relocations have to be recorded inside the BPF object file, which then that particular, that object file is being loaded by libbpf. And all the relocation are essentially happening programmer or the developer of the BPF tools, all you do is just write your um, write your code what do you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so you just have to write it once and then load it and it would simply work. And this proved out to be indeed the case. So now let's look at the tools that I had to develop to satisfy all the um, requirements that we had. So the first one is aptly named TCP snoop. So the idea there is to essentially snoop all incoming or outgoing TCP connections. And it only snoops them on their in initialization, so not every packet. So this is not some uh, deep packet inspection framework that's supposed to, you know, uh, just make a mirror of your traffic. No, we only care about the endpoints when someone tries to connect to a machine that, that is running TCP snoop or uh, a connection that, that that machine is initializing. So the way this is achieved, uh, is by essentially using um, BPF but, and hooking uh, on K-probes and K-red probes. So for the incoming connection, it's sufficient to hook um, on INET CSK accept because, or rather, uh, I, I believe that that actually was using um, a K-probe and a, and, a, and a red probe. So a K-probe is used upon uh, entering that function so that, so that we remember the context of which thread actually is initializing that particular uh, connection. We also save um, we also save a um, small, um, like a context that we can then use within the um, K-red probe. Then the TCP v4 connect that is used to, to when snooping outgoing connection. Uh, again, here we use the same thing where the K-probe actually records the struct socket context as well as the TIT and on K-red probe, uh, we, we are able to go back and uh, 
get a pointer to that uh, to that socket context. So the logic here is that we only want to record events when a particular connection has been successfully established. So we do not care if someone like if we try to um, to connect to some remote host and for whatever reason that host is down. So no connection is happening. So we do not uh, essentially trace those cases. And it's similar thing when uh, talking about uh, TCP uh, TCP connections. We basically um, just hook the TCP v6 function rather than the TCP uh, v4. Okay. So here is uh, one of the one of the places where. Uh, B uh, BP BPF core re is actually helpful. So in this particular commit, um, the essentially the guts, the implementation detail of uh, struct socket was changed. So as you can see here, the SK protocol value was initially an eight bit. Um, it was an eight eight bit. Yeah, that, that those a bit field. So it was a it was a one byte value, but in a bit field. Whereas uh, whereas following this this commit, that particular uh, value was actually changed to a to a two byte uh, to a two byte value. So, if we were using like the old school um, BCC compiler collections, this meant that we need to have one BPF program for the kernels that do not have those commit that uh, that, that do not have this particular commit, and for and one for kernels uh, following this particular commit. And as you can imagine, that this would have been a complete uh, a complete madness to to maintain. So in uh, in contrast, when using BPF Core E, what happens is we use this particular ma macro. So that's the line in uh, the actual BPF source code that I used to uh, essentially uh, get the value of SK protocol. And uh, using this particular macro would put some it would pre-process the, the source code and it would put some um, compiler-specific di di directives to basically um, write relocation information about about the SK protocol field. So on subsequently, when and when once the BPF object file is generated, it will contain those uh, relocation information inside of it. So subsequently, when that file is being loaded either on a kernel which um, does have or doesn't have that particular commit, libbpf uh, based on the information provided by the um, present a BTF information would be able to resolve those relocation and essentially do the right thing. So that is if you're reading, you know, just an uh, eight bit value from a bit field or you're reading an actual uh, member, uh, a standalone member. So that was really good and really beneficial for maintainability. Uh, so the next two that I had to develop was DNS snoop. So in essence, it basically, because DNS is a connectionless protocol, it pretty much snoops all DNS packets, assuming that uh, all the packets have either um, um, a, a response or a query, a DNS a response or a query. So the way it's uh, implemented, it's using something which is a little bit more old school, so to say. So it's using the, the essentially the mechanism that's used by TCP dump, where uh, it attaches an eBPF program via SO attach BPF, uh, TCP dump pretty much does the same thing, and all the raw packets that pass through the machine are are passed to that particular to that uh, socket where the eBPF program is attached, and so the eBPF program is able to it's it's doing a minimal parsing of each um, of each uh, network packet to decide is this a DNS traffic or is it not, and if it's not, it simply disregards um, the packet. And once we know that the packet is a DNS packet, it's passed to user space uh, to a little Golang program that uh, essentially does all the uh, more deep, uh, deeper um, packet passing and seeing, okay, is this an A or uh, um, IPv6 based um, triple, uh, quadruple A queries or MX queries. So currently only... Uh, Essentially, A records and <clears throat> and MX records are uh, supported, but there is no no reason why some of the other DNS types can't be supported. It's just that this was in the initial uh, requirements. Uh, so the next the next two is Chatter Snoop, and as I said, one of the requirements it was to be able to say when an immutable file is created. So initially, uh, ODD seems to be a good candidate to do that. However, um, the CHatter uh, the, the IOCTO, which does the CHatter, uh, 
which does setting up the immutable flag, uh, basically takes a pointer. And with ODD, you are not able to really uh, look through pointers. So it's not possible to see, okay, um, if this particular system call is invoked, then uh, what is the argument that is being passed? So the way to do that is to essentially um, use a K probe on uh, do VFS IOCTO function, check whether SI, SI mutable is set or unset, and that way you know whether you know a file will be immutable or not. Um, here is another uh, piece of BP where BPF uh, Cori was really uh, useful. So again, after a particular version of the kernel, uh, the way the way uh, the, the file authors are being set on a file, they're either done via a specific file author set function, or they were done through the generic unlocked IOCTO function. So what happens? What happens? So what happens is that we have a BPF core field exists function, which is able to uh, basically detect again based on the BTF information present on the running system whether that member um, exists or doesn't exist, and based on that, essentially change uh, or rather dynamically decide which uh, uh, which code path to take. And the good thing is that the code path which is um, not taken uh, because it can actually be eliminated. It's like a dead code elimination. So we do not get any, um, we do not get any um, uh, like unused code path or whatever errors from BPF. Okay, and the final one, uh, the final uh, sort of snooper that I developed, and that's a pretty straightforward one, is uh, essentially cron snoop, which basically um, uh, generates events events based on whether a particular entry in the uh, crontap one of the crontap tables be that the, a user specific or a system one uh, gets created or not so the way it works is it just installs fs notify watches on particular uh, locations in the file system it does an initial pass over the um, existing crontap file so it creates um, like a mirror database in memory and so on every subsequent uh, like modification of one of the files, it has to uh, parse the current content of the file compared against what we currently have in our sort of shadow um, in memory uh, database and decide whether we have a removal or an addition of a cron entry. And that's how we were able to say, yes, um, there's an addition or there is a removal. And um, that was pretty much it on my end. Thank you. That, I guess that means that I should switch over back to Jeff. Yes, please. You are the presenter now. Thank you. OK. So I thought I'd do a, a quick demo. Um, which will show some of the features. I'm not going to dive too deeply into it. Um, so this is the main dashboard of uh, the Velociraptor UI. Uh, this is just on my home network. There's only one active client right now. Um, so this is a not particularly busy server and not many clients. Um, this is where you would set up hunts, which allows you to, uh, say, collect an artifact on every node on your system, on, in your network. So if I want to see mounts for every system, we can kick it off. It'll run in the background, and we can come back to it. This is how you configure artifacts. So we talked about how uh, artifacts are a series of queries uh, that can be assembled to generate rows of data uh, that will ultimately be you know, generated as events. Uh, so we have here the SSH login uh, artifact that we have a source for syslog here. At the top. I need to switch over here, don't I? Oh, it doesn't actually show me. I don't have my pointer anymore. Uh, the top part is a source for syslog, and then the bottom part is a source for systemd. And these events can be combined and in, in, uh, uh, collected directly. Um, 
and that will end up by uh, if we can show here uh, these are server records um, you can see what ends up going to the client so this is the client list here uh, I'm not sure what the the green one the green one in the middle I think is the server itself uh, VM 184 is my test node we can see that uh, we can collect the agent version uh, the name uh, there should have been kernel version here as well but I need to figure out why that's not there the MAC addresses associated with the system and uh, there should be IP addresses as well but um, I think I need to integrate some more changes into my demo server um, one of the things we can do is execute shell commands so I did this one earlier we can do that again And so this is executed on the remote side. Now, as I was saying earlier, we have the ability to uh, audit that. And so we can see this is me. Uh, the top entry is me uh, testing it to make sure it would work before the demo. And then the bottom one is what I just did. So you can see uh, the when uh, the command was executed on what host, by whom, and what the results were. And for any command executed through that shell interface, you'll get one of these records. And those records are forwarded to Humio. So that's the audit trail. You can see if our hunt is done. And so we can see it queried the remote host, VM184, and now has all the mounts on that system. And so it gets into a little bit uh, with all the built-in file systems. The Server artifacts are, um, well, the Kafka client events client artifact is how we forward events to Humio. And the report is how many events it's been forwarding. And uh, we can see this is how it's configured, uh, forwarding all of these different um, artifacts. And although the uh, Humio server is not set up uh, from my home network. We can see uh, the IT security um, test deployment systems are pushing events to it already. Um, so this is process executions on the on the host. Anytime a shell command or you know it, realistically it's an exec happens, we get an event showing uh, a number of different things like the PID, uh, the user. Uh, the user ID, what the command line was, what the executable was, um, and when it happened. And uh, you get one of these events for any time a command is executed. Um, this is uh, some regular uh, statistics collection that happens on the endpoints. And so you can see uh, how much memory, what the CPU usage is over time uh, for every uh, node on the network. We can drill into uh, the client a little bit. Um, you can see if there's SSH logins. This is uh, SSH logins by me uh, from my uh, workstation. Um, we can see DNS connections or DNS requests, um, mostly doing updates. Uh, this is uh, my home, um, uh, what is it, the update proxy. Um, there hasn't been any immutable files, TCP connections. Um, this is connecting to the uh, Velociraptor front end which, you know, Velociraptor user. Uh, this is the SSH connections that we saw in the SSH log. Um, and I haven't done it. I don't think there's any cron updates. We can search for hosts and get just those. We can search for MAC addresses. We can search for a number of different things to get a, a record. So, oh, that's the missing IP information. Um, and lastly, uh, the user admin tool 
Um, and this is me writing UI code, which is something I never expected to be doing. Um, but we can see uh, just the basic user setup. Uh, the organizations over here is, is a new thing in Velociraptor. Um, organizational root covers all of them. So if you say, I don't want to be a member of that one anymore, it'll take you out of the organizational root. And if you put it back, oops, I need to, still working on this. Uh, here we see the roles and uh, what the permissions uh, each one means. Uh, so I, there's little tool tips indicating uh, what each of the permissions means on the endpoint. And if we turn off server administrator, so they're all off, we can say regular read-only user only lets you read results. An investigator lets you do queries, collect from the client, but not anything on the server side. Um, because on the server side, you end up uh, being able to get basically root access on remote hosts, and that's not something you necessarily want. And this is the interface if you're a privileged user, if you're an unprivileged user, well, if you're a server admin user, if you have like a read results um, permission and that's it, you only see your information in read-only form. Um, and I think that wraps up what I wanted to show in the demo. Does anybody have any questions? Lots of questions in the chat, though. Getting into the details of BPF, that should probably be written down somewhere <laughs> rather than reiterating it. Right. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of it has been discussion, but I have seen a question from Anton uh, that he says that it looks like a pretty powerful tool. Uh, what is what is the protocol being used between the server and clients? What is the protection against command in the middle attacks and so on? Sure. So uh, the protocol between the server and the clients is uh, gRPC uh, over HTTP, and it's TLS encrypted using a CA, a CA that is generated by the Velociraptor server itself and distributed as part of the config file, which I had meant to show as well. There we go. Oh, weird. So the clients won't connect to any system that doesn't have the CA they're configured to connect to. And as part of the client registration process, uh, the client certificate is generated and handed to the client so that uh, that's how it authenticates. So there's no way to say, I'm this other client unless you've been able to steal their key. OK, thank you. If anybody else a question, please come up on the camera or, or say it out loud on the mic. Um, if there indeed was a question in the chat, which I for, you know, which I somehow missed among the eBPF details discussion, um, perhaps repeat it or or somehow signal to me where it is. Okay. Uh, if not, then I will thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I will stop the recording now. Thanks, Mark. Uh, there is a question. There is a question. Larry's last minute question from Enzo. Can you set alerts to a particular filter you set? Yes. And the way you do that is through generating artifacts that uh, consume other ones. Um, so like th this is going to be a, a Windows specific one, but it's a, an easy example to show where you can say uh, you watch the, mo you do this watch monitoring and this will uh, generate events uh, that are coming from a, a different artifact and then you can chain them together to do whatever you want for it. So this could be um, anything from sending an email, a page, posting a Slack message, anything like that. Um, it's up to you what you want the alert to look like. But 
the, the, the ability to monitor other artifacts to take action on them uh, is something that's built in from the bottom up. Okay, thank you. Any other last, last minute questions? Does look like it? And uh... oh, one last thing, Martin. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who had a role in this project because it's it's not just me and Nick. There's been a lot of people contributing, um, either in idea form, in code form, uh, in shepherding it through the organization. And I just wanted to make sure everyone was recognized. So thank you for your contributions.